What are the four types of scoliosis and what treatment options are associated with them? When a patient is diagnosed with scoliosis, very often they're not really told what type of scoliosis they can have and that scoliosis has many, many different variations because scoliosis is highly variable, ranging to mild, moderate, to severe, to even very severe. And scoliosis can develop in many different areas of the spine. This includes the neck, which is the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, which is the mid or upper back, and of course the lumbar spine, which is the low back. There are different types of curved types and patterns that can occur with scoliosis, and all these have different nuances to the treatment process in terms of what type of treatment you should receive. Because all these types of scoliosis is gonna have different types of causes, We've really kind of broken down scoliosis into, main, into four main categories or types when we look at scoliosis. There's something called idiopathic scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis, neuromuscular scoliosis, and congenital scoliosis. So let's talk about all four of these. First of all, idiopathic scoliosis is a very fancy way of saying there is not one clearly associated known cause with the condition. It means unknown cause. Idiopathic scoliosis is thought to be a multi-factor problem. I mean, there's many, many different things that can contribute towards the causation of scoliosis. The theories are dozens and dozens of theories that could be associated with the causation. And since there's multiple variables, patients can have more than one. They can have two or three different factors that can be contributing towards their scoliosis. One thing we can definitely talk about is genetics, that we know scoliosis, idiopathic scoliosis is not 100% genetic cause because they've done studies on identical twins that they've only found about 50 to 60% of identical twins to both share scoliosis, and these are patients that have the exact same DNA. Even though we don't know what causes scoliosis, we do know what to expect in terms of its development and how it progresses. Scoliosis pretty much progresses as a result of growth. Whatever causes the scoliosis initiates the curve typically in juvenile years, and then something happens when the patients grow that causes the curve to grow uh, with them. So as the patient goes through their adolescent puberty, uh, puberty growth spurt is when curves progress. The average age of diagnosis because of it grows during puberty is between 10 and 18. And it's highly more associated with girls versus boys. And idiopathic scoliosis in the adolescent stage, either untreated or undiagnosed, is also the most prevalent type of scoliosis in adult cases, meaning it's idiopathic adolescent scoliosis in the adult form. Now, in the adult form, there's also another type of scoliosis that's called degenerative scoliosis. And this is the second most prevalent type in the adult patient. Adult scoliosis or degenerative scoliosis or de novo scoliosis is another way of calling it, causes because the spine goes through a degenerative phase. Now, a lot of doctors will say, oh, this is just naturally related to age-related conditions or age-related degeneration. I don't believe that to be true at all because if that was the case, that means every single adult patient would have degenerative scoliosis because everybody's naturally aging. What I believe happens is there's a small injury or small misalignment that tends to occur to the spine, causes the spine to shift out of alignment. It remains uncorrected for years. And this, un this misalignment or uncorrected misalignment in the spine causes abnormal or accelerated aging in that area. And as a result, somewhere around 40 years of age, most commonly in women, for whatever reason, it, we believe it's mostly to bone density or hormonal changes that the scoliosis starts to develop. And it's most commonly in the lumbar spine and it's most commonly the number one symptom it causes low back pain, sciatica, or pain down into the legs. So degenerative scoliosis, we know what causes it. But just like idiopathic scoliosis, by the time we actually find it, the curve has become significant enough that the curve itself becomes its own problem. And this is something that's true with the majority of cases of scoliosis, which we'll talk about in a minute. The third type is something called neuromuscular scoliosis. I like to break that down into two words, a neurological and muscular type of scoliosis. Neuromuscular scoliosis is a very complex problem. And the reason why, because there's normally an underlying condition an, under, an under, underlying neuromuscular condition, something like spina bifida, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, ehlers downer syndrome, just to name a few of these things. And what happens is that we can divide these things into two different main types of, of categories. The muscular component is something that affects the connective tissue of the body. And it does one of two things. It either causes the connective tissue to be too contracted, something like cerebral palsy, and these contractures can lead to a scoliosis while they're developing and growing in their juvenile states and, and progress during adolescent states. Or it does the opposite. 
it causes too much laxity, like Ehlers Downer syndrome or Marfan syndrome, where these ligaments and muscles have become too laxed and too and not tight enough, and that can cause a scoliosis or a curvature to occur at the exact same time. And those are normally the muscular component of the neuromuscular component. However, there's also a neurological component that can happen. Somebody can actually have something in the nerve system itself, like a syrinx or a tether cord or, or something along that's actually affecting the neurologi neurologically component of the body. It also can be a brain condition. And these things can actually cause scoliosis from developing as well. So it can be the, either a muscular component or a neurological component, but all these are combined into this thing called a neuromuscular condition or neuromuscular scoliosis. Now, interesting enough, in majority of these cases, these neuromuscular cases, the scoliosis is almost treated like an idiopathic scoliosis because most of these neuromuscular conditions are also idiopathic. And once they develop a scoliosis and they start progressing, the curve itself becomes its own problem. So most of these patients with these neuromuscular syndr syndromes, the curve is treated like a scoliosis, meaning if you were to eliminate the neuromuscular component, you know, after the curve becomes 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees, their curve isn't going to go, isn't going to magically go away because it's become structural because it's happened during their growth phase. Okay. And this is something, again, that I've mentioned that's common with all these cases of scoliosis that after a period of time, no matter what the cause, these scoliosis is, they become their own problem and they must be dealt with structurally. The last type is something called congenital scoliosis. And congenital scoliosis is truly scoliosis that you're born with. And the reason why you're born with this is this actually develops in utero. And it's basically one of the bones of the spine. Instead of being equal rectangles stacked upon each other, we have a, something called a triangle or a hemivertebra in between some vertebras. And you can have multiple hemivertebras in a row, or you can have some bone, bones that don't fully separate or become distinct and they actually stay partially fused. This happens in utero, you're born this way. It's called a congenital scoliosis. And the hallmark is something that's malformed with the vertebral bodies or the bones of the spine themselves. Congenital scoliosis can be the most difficult to, to treat because it is a true bone bony deformity. But what tends to happen is that they're born this like this and then the curve will sit there, but then the curve will develop into greater than just the deformity that occurs in the hemivertebra. So let's say they have a hemivertebra that contributes towards 20 or 30 degrees of their scoliosis, but during juvenile years and adolescent, the, the bones and the spine above that adapt faster during these growth phases and they can develop another 30, 40, 50 degrees up top of that. So we know we have limitations with uh, congenital scoliosis, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't try to treat it and try to control it during these growth phases because that's really when curves tend to progress. So when we look at all four types of the scoliosis, what types of treatments do they actually need? Well, first of all, all types of scoliosis treatment is guided by really the, pa the patient's characteristics, their age, the severity, location, and of course, what type of cause of one of those four. Idiopathic scoliosis we know is, a, is treated and effectively treated in terms of working towards a reduction on a structural level. And the reason why we wanna to work towards a uh, structural reduction, because we know as curves get bigger, they're more likely to get bigger as they're growing. And the bigger the curve becomes while they're growing, the faster it becomes bigger. So reducing the curve is the number one way at stopping curve progression is, um, during growth phases. So we definitely look at reducing scoliosis in the, in, the in the adolescent idiopathic cases. We wanna reduce them and reduce them as quickly as we can. The smaller we find the curve, the, the better chance we have of reducing it. So a lot of patients are told not to worry about their scoliosis until it becomes severe enough to, to where they need surgery. And I would take the exact opposite approach, meaning the smaller the curve, the more and the faster you treat it, the more likely you are not to have a severe curve. Because if you ever develop a severe curve, most patients always ask, why didn't we treat it sooner? So the sooner the better in idiopathic scoliosis, especially in adolescent cases. Degenerative scoliosis for aging adults tends to focus more on pain because it tends to, the number one symptom tends to be pain. That's what brings on the diagnosis, not a posture asymmetry or some type of deformity they see in their body. It's normally pain related. So normally the first thing we wanna do is improve the pain. Now, improving pain is normally a twofold thing. Meaning if you just try to hide the pain with, with pain medications or pain treatments that are just kind of masking what the person is feeling but not addressing the cause of the problem, it's kind of kicking the can down the road. The curve is still progressing. The curve is still getting bigger, causing more damage, more degeneration. And then normally they end with a more severe problem. And the problem with degenerative scoliosis for adult cases 
unlike idiopathic scoliosis in adolescent cases, these cases can't just run and have surgery. And not that I'm recommending that, but they can't because adult patients do not respond well to scoliosis surgery. In fact, the prognosis is very poor. The likelihood of complication is very high. And even surgeons are not a big fan of doing this type of surgery in an adult patient because the likelihood of there being a problem, unfortunately, could be greater than the, than the problem they're dealing with currently. So therefore, letting scoliosis is just progress in the adult stage and trying to just take medications and hiding the pain where the curve is progressing could lead to some very serious complications and outcomes that are not favorable for the patient's long-term long stability. So my recommendation is if there is a scoliosis and you know there's progressing and you also are experiencing pain or problems from it, also, the best way is to try to reduce this curve. Now, significant reductions like there are in adolescent cases aren't as great. It means we're not going to get the greatest percentage reduction. Like we're in some kids, we can get 35, 40% reduction conservatively. Um, where in adult patients, we only get 20, 25% reduction, but the reduction is still there. And when normally when you reduce the, uh, the size of the curve, you can help improve the impact that the scoliosis is having on the body. Now, neuromuscular scoliosis treatment is also something that's different because a lot of times patients will want to have treatment for their neuromuscular problem. Some neuromuscular conditions we cannot treat conservatively because they're so extensive and they're causing so many problems that the patient can't respond to conservative treatment. But that's a vast minority of the neuromuscular conditions. So let's say if I were to find 100 neuromuscular patients that come in my office, I would say probably two to three of them I probably would not be able to treat in any method at all. Most of the times we can use conservative methods to help manage and treat neuromuscular conditions, but just like degenerative scoliosis, the expectations may be less. Now, some neuromuscular conditions, especially the ones associated with the laxity of the ligaments and muscles, may actually get a better reduction initially because your spine is more flexible, it's easier to reduce, but they're much more difficult to stabilize. So treatment may last longer, stabilization may last longer, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's impossible. The ones with contractures, the opposite component we're trying to do, we're trying to improve flexibility into these areas, which can sometimes make it difficult to reduce. But since the contractures are there, they're kind of holding the spine and not letting it, it makes it more stable post-treatment. The last one is neurological. When there's a neurological component in this neuromuscular component, first thing we have to make sure it's safe. And these are the ones that we may not be able to treat if they have some serious condition within the spinal cord and brain or brain stem that we cannot be applying forces to the spine because there could be some harm. And some of these things could, could be diagnosed very simply with an MRI. But again, the majority of these cases that we find, even in neurological component, again, 99, 98 out of 100 of these cases, we still treat them almost like an idiopathic condition because we're trying to reduce the curve to stop progression during adolescence and growth. The most difficult of all of them is congenital scoliosis because congenital scoliosis is where there is a bony malformation within the vertebra themselves. It means one of the bones or multiple bones are physically shaped in, improperly from birth and there's no way to alter that. The best way to treat a congenital scoliosis is to measure the size of the congenital deformity and try to figure out how much degrees for scoliosis does that account for in their overall scoliosis condition. For example, let's say the patient comes in our office and they're 12 or 13 years old. So let's say they have a 50 degree thoracic curve. And in this thoracic curve, they have a hemi vertebra, and the hemi vertebra accounts for 20 or 25 degrees of their thoracic scoliosis. So we know the maximum window for reduction is going to be 25 degrees, 50 minus 25 degrees of the hemi vertebra. So we have 25 degree maximum reduction. In most of those cases, we're not getting that full 25 degrees because it'd be almost impossible because that means get, you're eliminating 100% of whatever occurred as a result of the growth and development of, of the body. So nobody would get a percentage of that piece. So that's the way you look at a congenital scoliosis. You figure out what the hemivertebrae is, you figure out what the total scoliosis is, you subtract those two numbers, and you take a percentage of what you think you can reduce in that area. But however, congenital scoliosis can still be improved and depends on the severity of the deformity. I've seen patients with have that have severe congenital anomalies in their spine that they can have 13 or 14 ribs on one side and nine ribs on the other, much more difficult to deal with. Sometimes they have ribs that are fused together on one side that's causing the, the, the spine to curve as they grow because the, the ribs aren't fully separated. Very, very difficult to manage conservatively. Some of these can be very, very difficult, but some of them can actually be treated. And the only way to know is to have your spine evaluated and x-rayed and determine what's the best approach in a conservative and the conservative method of treating a scoliosis. So the closing thoughts here is effective treatment for all four types of scoliosis must be proactive, must be customized, must be driven by the underlying cause of the condition, and most importantly, 
I believe in almost every case of scoliosis is trying to reduce the curve as opposed to just trying to slow down progression. I believe trying to slow down progression is trying to slow down a runaway train during growth phases or in late stage, uh, in late stage uh, life, when, like adult scoliosis, it's progressing relatively quickly in that stage. Just trying to slow it down normally means there's progression and more than you want. I like the approach of trying to reduce the curve as aggressively and as quickly as possible to a yet way, because when you have a smaller curve, you automatically reduce the risk of progression because smaller curves in every age group always progress less than bigger curves. So that's our recommendation. And then if you think you, and you know you have scoliosis, to be evaluated properly and evaluated by somebody who's gonna be matching the treatment option that you would like, meaning if you're looking for more of a conservative option, that you find somebody who specializes in conservative type of care. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.